morning. This has been quite a week, hasn't it? An interesting time in our country, no matter, uh, and really regardless of how you voted or whom you were hoping to win the elections, I think we can all agree that something fundamental has changed in our country. This should be a sobering moment. A time to reflect on what's occurring in our nation and what needs to happen to bring healing and how we can find peace. Really less about who wins an election, but how we've come to this place where there's such division in our country. I want to talk about that this morning. We're going to just put aside our sermon series we've been in and talk for a few minutes about what needs to happen to bring healing and peace and how we can be a part of that. Deal? Deal? Of course, God is still on the throne. God is on the throne, but I can uh, sympathize with those who feel like that would be a pithy response. One that can come across as shallow in light of the division that has been brought to light in this election season. But God is still on the throne. Jesus knew that better than anyone. However, even Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus. Even Jesus looked upon the city of Jerusalem And wept at its brokenness. In light of the conflicts within our country, I believe to the core of my being, we need peacemakers more than ever. We need the gospel more than ever. Instead, some people don't think we need peace. We don't need peacemakers. We don't need the gospel. We just need a candidate. And they think that The defeat of their candidate is the defeat of the gospel, or the victory of their candidate is validation of the gospel. But friends, salvation doesn't come from a political party. It comes from Jesus. I found comfort in the scriptures this week, trying to reflect on what what it is that God says to us, how we would, um, how would we understand these times. These words from Isaiah 58 that were just read to us, are powerful. Do you believe them? That if we call upon the Lord, He will answer our cry? That if we put away the malicious talk and the finger pointing and spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry, satisfying the needs of the oppressed, then light will rise amidst the darkness. And your night will become like the noonday. Do we believe this to be the word of God? That if we cry for help to the Lord and we spend ourselves in the kingdom work, that he uh, will make that light in us to rise in the darkness? Or is that cry for help and hope only reserved for a party candidate of choice? Let's say we do away with the finger pointing and the malicious talk and instead talk about healing the divide. I want to share a reflection of healing during our time today. These are just my humble thoughts. But there are four things I think we can pour our energy into that will bring you encouragement. The first one one is this. There has never been a better time for the church to be the church. Amen? Not a political action committee, not a mouthpiece for a political party. The church has called us to be Uh, In this time, the hands and feet of Jesus, God has called us to be the church. Kerry Nyhoff is equipped. If God has all the same opinions as that of your political party, you probably are not worshiping God. The church instead is set apart. We've talked in this series on being called and sent that the church is not something we attend for an hour on Sunday. It's something we are 24-7. We bring the church and the gospel home with us. We bring it to our workplaces, to times with friends, to social media. Friends, you are the gospel. You are the church everywhere that you go. Which means you bring the love and the hope and the truth of Christ everywhere you go. Authentic, grace-filled, hope-filled people are what our neighbors need most. What our friends need most. So this is an opportunity to be the church. This is an opportunity to lay down cynicism and 
anger and sow peace. I promise to work on that myself. This is, this is a time for sowing peace, which is more than, than just words. It's about how we conduct ourselves. Paul, in his letters to the Philippians, says, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, the Greek word here for con- conduct yourself, conduct, is the word we get politics from. Paluasthai is the word. Paluasthai. Conduct yourself. Politic yourself in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, this is an opportunity for us to be the church and how we conduct ourselves. And that leads me to my next encouragement. Next encouragement is this, to be peacemakers. How do we start friendships with someone that is different than ourselves? We live in a time, such an angry time, where there's an immense amount of blame and hostility and judgment towards people who are different than ourselves. It saddens me to my core that this election season was built on this from from both sides. And I expect a change in our president-elect. This wasn't just politics as usual. This is a bird of another feather. This is a turning point. I've long held that fear leads us to distance ourselves from those who are different, to circle the wagons, as they say, right? Remember that the old westerns where the cowboys would get ready for a gunfight and they'd circle the wagons to uh, fight it off, fight the battle. So we have in our culture and in our day a tendency for each of us to some degree or another to circle our wagons. And what we see across the spectrum of society is a tendency for many to entrench themselves in the comfort of their choice of political dogmatism and it leads towards this self-righteous, embattling attitude. And in a world that has lost a sense of self that's rooted in Jesus Christ, their maker, it's lost its identity, lost its ability to see every person as a child of God, well then, we turn to greater presumption about other people. Perhaps you found yourself doing this with others during the the election season. But this I know to be true about Jesus. Jesus always calls us to the edge of our presumption. Not the center where we believe we see accurately all that the world is, and if only others could see how we see, then the world would be perfect. No. Jesus calls us to the edge of our presumption. Out from behind the circled wagons. When is the last time you did this, friends? Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote these words while in prison in Nazi Germany. They are prophetic. And I'm borrowing them from a friend, uh, uh, Richard Dahlstrom, who shared them uh, just recently. He says this, Nothing that we despise in other men is inherently absent from ourselves. Right? We must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or don't do and more in light of what they suffer. Dahlstrom adds that this is, of course, not a, a call to be silent or to lack discernment or to gloss over all the different kinds of conflicts that we face in our country and in our time, but instead, Bonhoeffer is urging us to do the thing that we must do, the best thing that we can do, and that is to live under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. Which will mean getting out from behind the circled wagons and crossing social divides, speaking out against racism and sexism, practicing hospitality and generosity, and working towards a better country, a better nation, but at the same time resisting the urge to make an idol out of our country, to make an idol out of a political party. Friends, when we follow Jesus, we are living into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. God is still on the throne. Is it the calling of the church in this time to circle the wagons? Or is God calling people to the edge where we find the heart of God? 
What's this I know? Whenever, whenever I have circled the wagons in my own heart and in my own life, whenever I, I've fortified a defensive position in that place, what rules in my heart is fear and self-protection and religious dogmatism and self-righteousness. And I don't like the circled wagons. I don't find peace there. I certainly don't see much of the kingdom happening behind those circled wagons. There is another way. A member of our church, Zoe Pearson, gives a reflection in our storyboards. We've talked about the story of us and stories from people in our own church about how they've experienced the kingdom of God in this place. And she has a reflection of seeing the kingdom of God made visible. Listen to this, her words. They are prophetic. She says this, once you can put a name and a face on whatever it is we're talking about, a refugee, a gay person, a name or a face on poverty, then it becomes part of your heart. It's more than just talking about it. Until you can do that, until you can say that refugee is Huda, a mom, that gay person is Mary, my friend, or that young woman living in poverty, her name is Hawa. In Africa. Once you can do that, then it doesn't become a job. I would say it doesn't become a label either. It becomes part of your heart. She says, it's what we do. So that has been the experience that has grown for me. I think for most of the good neighbor team, she's referring to the team that was working with the refugee house, the safe haven house. She goes on to say, no longer do we see Arabs or Muslims as a faceless, nameless group of people. We see them as Muhammad and Huda and Ibrahim and Abdul and Ahmed and Isa and Eklas and Razul. That's who the Muslims are. That's what serving on this team has done. This, friends, is someone who is experiencing the kingdom. Someone who has found the gift that comes when you step out of the circled wagons. Challenge presumption about the other. And see Jesus at work. What if we followed Zoe's example and built three genuine friendships with people who are different than ourselves? What if you did that? Three, genuine friendships with someone different than yourself. Someone with a different uh, belief system or marital status or social status, a different color. Maybe a different sexual orientation. Before you think that's outrageous, just know it puts you in great company. This is what Jesus did and it, it just infuriated the religious elite. That he would step across the divide. That he would gather together for meals and community with people who were so much different. I experienced this just two weeks ago. I, uh, in preparation for Wednesday night's class where we're talking about uh, Islam and understanding Islam, we're inviting the imam from the uh, Muslim temple up here in Bridgeport to come and speak with us. And so I went to one of their services on a Friday, had a chance to meet with him. He's a, a very sweet and gentle man. He gave a sermon, a message to his people about what it means to help make Tacoma better. To love people. We're not so, so different. Him and I. Him and me. We're, we're both wanting to see Tacoma be a better, more peaceful place. And we're going to have a chance to get to know him a little bit more later on this week. But I just, uh, I revel in how Jesus would lead me to come out from behind the circled wagons and to meet somebody totally different from me, different belief system. Am I laying down my love for Jesus and my faith in Christ? No. But I'm stepping out from behind the circled wagons. There's this beautiful moment of God just showing himself in that to those of us who gathered that day to meet with Imam Ahmed. So, start a friendship. I think healing the divide is, is going to be started with this sort of thing. Not the, 
the blaming and the anger and the rhetoric back and forth, but starting genuine friendships. The third one is this, is to own your stuff. Own your stuff. Confess your sin. How much of the negativity or apathy we see in our culture, how much of that can you own? If you're anything like me, I'd rather blame than take responsibility. I'd rather deflect than reflect. But some of Jesus' most difficult words are directed right to me, perhaps to you too. He says in Matthew 7, this is the message version. I love how this is articulated. It says, don't pick on people. Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus says, own your stuff. Maybe if we got better at confessing rather than blaming, better at introspection than arguing, we'd recapture the beauty of the gospel. The sin of wanting to be right is awful. The sin of having to get your own way all the time is awful. What can we confess today? What part of the rift do you own? Who have you hurt? Who do you hate? Have you hurt anyone? Doesn't mean you have to abandon your convictions. Quite the opposite. I disagree with many. But to each person I've said, I love and respect you. In fact, one of the truest signs of maturity is the ability to disagree while still remaining respectful. Well, friends, for what it's worth, those of us with kids and grandkids, if you're worried about your kids watching politicians and mimicking them, I promise you that our kids are watching you and me. My kids are watching me more closely than they're watching any politician. So I better take my personal sins seriously. I need to confess them. I need to repent. By God's grace to allow the Spirit to change me. When I confess my sins, I know this, as a husband, as a father, as a leader, as a friend, everyone around me begins to heal. When I confess my sin, everyone around me begins to heal. Imagine if that happened 10,000 times over in families and churches and communities around our country. Imagine if it just happened with those of us in this room, what kind of impact that could have in just Tacoma on healing the divide. If we started with us and owned our stuff, what say you? When I confess my sin, I experience the grace of God and I become a more humble and open person. So, own your stuff. The fourth one, and lastly, is this. Probably more important than any other is remember... The gift of prayer. The gift of prayer. Prayer is God's gift to us. God's grace is that we can approach him through prayer. More important than God's answering of prayer is the way that the Lord gives us peace, gives me peace as I surrender my will to his. Sometimes it's it's just in that daily quiet time that I get peace, but often it's when I'm gathering with other friends. I'm gathering to pray about what's going on in our world, what's going on in our lives. Prayer is the place where we receive God's love and we remember that we are God's beloved. And it's this place that we are called to lift up those who lead. Hear this, friends. 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 1 says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, And all who are high in positions, 
that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Paul himself is telling us it's time to pray more fervently, especially for those who lead us. That may be hard if you feel like you're on the losing side of this thing. It may be easy for you if you feel like you're on the winning side of things. But all of us together should be praying. Praying for our leaders, but also praying for God's will and way to be done in our hearts and in our world. Friends, this is a season where prayerful, peaceful, and loving action will go a long way to healing a divided nation. I can only imagine, let me close with this, I can only imagine how quickly and wonderfully we would change the world as Christians if our passion for politics was matched with the same such passion for prayer and the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. May it be so in us as the children of God. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you once again with a sobered sense of who we are. We thank you for your sovereignty and how you have worked in our lives, worked in the life of this community and the gift it is to draw near to one another. Lord, I pray that we can be sowers of peace. We can be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, not peacemongers, but peacemakers that our actions lead to peace. Lord, I know that that starts with us owning our stuff, coming to you in prayer, and longing for your will and your way. But also it means that we act in making new friendships with people that we never thought we would disagree or or agree with on uh, many things in life. But we see the image of God in them. And our presumption is put aside, and we start to see the healing occur. Jesus, would you help us to be the church? Not to stand by passively, but to act on our convictions towards peace and reconciliation. Help us to be the church. Help us to be authentic, grace-filled, hope-filled people. The kinds of people that our friends and neighbors need today. And we pray this in your name, and everyone said, amen.